Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Christine Upchurch Show. I'm so grateful you're joining us here today. You might be listening live on Transformation Talk Radio or KKNW AM 1150 in the Seattle area uh, or on Facebook Live on Christine Upchurch's professional page, like I'm talking about myself in the third person, on my professional page. <laughs> um, and uh, Or you might be listening after the fact on one of the dozens of podcasts it sends up in or on ChristineUpchurch.com. Whenever and wherever you're listening from, we're grateful you're joining us here today because we are going to be talking about something really exciting. Um, oh gosh, uh, he's a science nerd who's into consciousness, so he, you know, he's a man after my own heart. But at first, I want to say hello and thank you to the people behind the technology today, Benny Mathers from KKNW. Hey, Benny. Hey, how's it going, Christine? So I'm laughing. I really am because I'm like, have you checked out her page? It's so amazing. Like. She, Christine, you, you talked in your third oh. person. It was like, you <laughs> have never done that. It was just I I'm laughing really hard. Well, I mean, you know, it's hard to promote like, yourself when you really, really want to. And sometimes you really have to. And it's just like the way you said it was perfect. People, people who are Facebook friends with me are like, it's not, it's not live. On, but no, it's my professional page. It's just professional page. So I was trying to make that clear. Yeah, um, yeah so people can find it on Facebook. She is professional, uh, by the way, if you didn't know that already. <laughs> she's What's that? She's, she's professional by far, if you didn't know that already. <laughs> sometimes I am, sometimes I'm not. We'll see. Yes. I love it. I love it. Uh, but thank you for doing what you're doing at the KKNW end of things. And Jessica standing in for Olivia today. Hey, Jessica, TTR, how are you? Oh, my gosh, what a treat. And now I'm laughing, too, so thank you both. <laughs> <laughs> I love being the expense of other people's jokes. Yes. <laughs> oh, I am so excited today. Um, before I, I, I say who this person is, I have to tell you that when I heard about his background, um, I, it's like, oh my goodness, I really want to interview this man. And I realized we have some things in common. Um, he and I both studied math in, in our undergraduate uh, work in college. Mm -hmm. And he's also had a lifelong interest in consciousness. So, um, but he's, oh, he, he's this amazing person. And I'm talking about Tom Campbell. We're going to be talking about um, a big theory of everything. And it, in a way that is very different from the way I've heard about it from most scientists, most mystics. Um, his name is Tom Campbell. And he began researching states of consciousness with Bob Monroe of the Monroe Institute. Um, who wrote Journeys Out of the Body and was looking at out-of-body experiences. And he and another colleague helped set up the lab to do the research. And um, that was back in the 1970s. And they were early drug-free consciousness studies. And they helped develop the technology for creating specific altered states. And we're going to talk to him about that. And were the main subjects of studies. So they were also guinea pigs. I love that. At the same time. Campbell has been experimenting with and exploring the subjective and objective mind ever since then. So the past 30 years, he has focused on scientifically exploring the properties, boundaries, and abilities of consciousness. He's also been working as a scientist. He's a professional physicist, and he works on um, sort of cutting edge technology, large system simulation. And I think that that's probably um, no coincidence because of, of some theory that we're going to get into. And he has been at the heart of developing U.S. missile defense systems. So we're talking about a heavy duty scientist who's been also been exploring consciousness. Um, there's so much more to say, but I'm, I'm really grateful that he has written a trilogy that's in a very large book called My Big Toe. There it is. Awakening, Discovery, Inner Workings. The complete My Big Toe trilogy unifying philosophy, physics, and metaphysics. I would like to welcome our guest today, Tom Campbell. Hi, Tom. Welcome. Hi, Christine. Thank you very much for uh, asking me to come here. You know, I'm, I'm really grateful to be talking about the science of consciousness. Um, I think that we have had such a tendency to um, compartmentalize things. There's, mm -hmm. there's the mysticism and there's the science. There's the objective and the subjective. 
But what you've done and what you have created and are still in the process of creating is this, this theory that integrates them. And I really feel like our next stage of evolution has to do with the integration mm -hmm. of consciousness and, and, and matter. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what whetted your appetite to sort of go scientifically towards that realm? Well, I was uh, working on my PhD in experimental nuclear physics, and <clears throat> I saw an advertisement in the physics room, physics building door, to learn how to meditate. And I did that because that, that advertisement said that you could get by with less sleep if you meditated. And that's and really- school, that's, that's helpful, yes. Yeah, that's really yeah. what I was looking for. Uh, yeah. So uh, I paid my uh, $25, took my banana, and uh, went to the, the TM meeting. Uh -huh. And I found that it was very easy. I took to it you know, almost immediately. It was no trouble at all. And I practiced it, as they said, you know, 30 minutes twice a day. And about three months into that practice, just playing around a little bit. Now, I'm an experimentalist, so I play around a lot with things. I want to know how they work. Um, I realized that I could debug my software in my mind by bringing up a picture of the, of the printout, rolling the printout by, and the lines that had errors in them would be red. Uh -huh. So I could just scroll out, oh, there's a red line, back up. What is that? Oh, yeah, I, I know what that line is because I wrote all the code, so I was familiar with every line. And... I realized that then when I physically went those cards exactly, I say cards, that's back in the old day where we were doing punch cards. You know? Punch cards, oh, they were the worst too. They <laughs> yeah. Were, yeah. yeah, so uh, those cards were the ones that had errors on them and the errors I saw were the errors that were there. Uh -huh. And in those days of punch cards, that was huge. Today, we have terminals and we have software that helps us debug and we have lots of things, but not then. Then if you got one or two runs back from the computer center per week, you were lucky. And yeah. if those runs just said, oh, bombed at this place, stopped running here, that's all you got. That was the total sum of your, of your help finding your error is right. that, that the thing broke and you'd look at your printout and see where it quit. So it took, then you'd go fix that and you'd find out that, well, a card punch hole was a little off center. And that was the problem, you see. So there's lots of things other than even your code. So debugging code could take months and months. Wow. You know, it's not like today, it takes hours sometimes, but it took months yeah. and months then. And it was the main thing that kept your research slowed down, is trying to get your software right. So that was a big thing. Yeah. And that was a big aha moment for me because I realized that, you know, my my previous viewpoint of reality, which is, is uh, was that if you can't, you know, it's called an operational definition of reality. If you can't operate on it, if you can't measure it, then it either doesn't exist or it's irrelevant. The only yeah. things that exist or irrelevant are the things you can measure because, hey, if you can't interact with them, then, you know, what could they be, you know, right, hallucinations? Right. So that's the way most scientists look at reality. Well, here I was seeing that there was another dimension, mind, that could interact with this reality like debug software. And there was no physical causality involved in it. So that opened up another whole piece of reality for me. So what, so what physicists do is they model reality. That's that's kind of a real simple way of, of describing physics. Sure. So here I am, a physicist, modeling reality, and I realize there's a whole big chunk of reality that uh, I didn't even realize existed. Yeah. So that opened my mind to a lot of other possibilities. And within three months of that, well, no, it wasn't quite that long, probably more like uh, you know, a year or two after that, um, I was out of graduate school, took a job, and within a few months of taking that job, I had met Bob Monroe. Bob Monroe was looking for somebody to help him explain what happened to him, which was this out-of-body phenomena, because sure. Bob wanted to make it science. He wanted to make it uh, credible, not just a crazy old guy who had strange things happen to him. You know, He wanted right. to put some science behind it. So he was a wealthy guy, so he put up a lab, 
and said, all right, let's study this. But he really didn't have any plan after that. It was like, build it and they will come. You know, so he built it and there I was, myself and a friend of mine. And well, that was the beginning of a, of a probably a major change in my you know, life's course. Because within, oh, I don't know, you know, a year, Bob had taught myself and my friend Dennis Menerick how to go out of body on demand. So wow. now I was getting around in this larger reality. Uh -huh. And my job as the physicist was to figure out how does it work? Why does it work that way? What are its limitations? How mm -hmm. come sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work? You know, what's yeah. the what's the difference? So I spent then the next 35 years trying to come up with those answers. And I did it by doing research inside of consciousness. You see, inside that non-physical space I was in, consciousness uh -huh. is, is a non-physical space. So right. I could go there and I could do things, you know, all of the paranormal things or things that we did, because those are the things that, that can give you evidence. You know, when you remote view, you either get the target right or you don't get the target right. So it's evidence. If you heal, you either help that person get well or you don't. So right. those things are very evidential. Uh, if you're looking at auras and getting data out of databases, then it's either right or it's wrong. So we spent a lot of time collecting evidence to convince ourselves that we weren't just making it all up in our mind. There was some kind of mind trick going on because after all, I'm a physicist, he's an electrical engineer, and we're both pretty uh, difficult to convince about things like that. So we right. did a lot and a lot of research and it was probably, you know, 100,000 to one that we were actually good at guessing <laughs> these right answers. Uh -huh. So we knew intellectually that we had, you know, that we were onto something that was, that was real and that was fundamental. But sure. doing, knowing that intellectually and getting it at a deeper level are two different things. It's right. easy to get intellectually, but it's a little harder to get at a deep level to where you no longer have to ask that question, is this real? You mm -hmm. know it's real. Well, eventually I got to that point. And it was after Dennis and I did an out-of-body trip together. And uh, they were, we were, both, of our, both of what we were saying, Bob taught us to, to talk when we did our out-of-body. We'd be out-of-body, but we'd be giving a kind of a stream of consciousness download to Bob, who was at the control room and, and put everything on cassette tapes. Huh. And you, you two were in like separate. Yeah, we're in separate. We're booths, in separate right? booths. Yeah, he had yeah. three booths and they were all isolation booths acoustically isolated from each other. So you couldn't hear any sounds. Uh -huh. And I was in the first booth. There was an empty booth between Dennis and I. Dennis was in the third booth. And my booth was also a Faraday cage. That's a uh, means it was metal all around it. It was electromagnetically isolated as well. Uh -huh. So we couldn't hear each other or see each other, have any kind of contact with each other, even electromagnetic contact with each other. So we, we went out of body and we both have the stream of consciousness going back to the control room. And, and we met above the lab and went on an out of body adventure together. Uh -huh. And, you know, we, we got out of the, the booth about Two hours later, went up to the control room and, and uh, Bob took both of the tapes, Dennis's audio tape and mine, and he turned them on at the same time uh -huh. so that they were in sync time-wise. And there was Dennis and I having conversations, answering each other's questions, <laughs> talking. Oh, do you see that thing over there? Oh, you mean the red thing with the spire? Yeah, that's it. And the, and the yellow thing beside uh -huh. it? Right. Well, let's go over there and investigate that. Okay. You know, so we were obviously together in this out-of-body uh, experience. Uh -huh. And that was the thing that, that uh, from then on, I did not ask, is this real? Because that, <laughs> right. that, that got it at the gut level, finally, mm -hmm. and I was done. So I spent my time, years and years, going out of body and doing evidential things and seeing what difference it makes. Okay, you go and you, uh, you know, you remote view. Well, you approach it this way, you approach it that way, you you know, have different, not only different techniques, but different mental states, different mm -hmm. attitudes, sure. and which ones work, which ones don't, and why, you know, and what does diet have to do with it? You know, do you do mm -hmm. better or worse, depending on the kind of things you eat? Just, right. there's lots and lots of variables, really hundreds of variables. That's why it takes so long, because it takes 35 years, but, you know, to work through 
all the, the kind of variables that you need to work through in order to come up with a conclusion. So, right. you know, that took us up to the 1990s. Dennis and I were starting this like 1970. So mm -hmm. by the mid 1990s, I thought I understood it. And then when I wrote the My Big Toe book, and that was to be a book about consciousness primarily, although I knew that consciousness was fundamental and the physical world was derived from consciousness. And the way and, I knew... Okay, and, and that, that, that's huge. So just yeah. repeat that one more time. I want our listeners to, okay. to hear that again. Yeah, I, I knew is one of the facts. I had a whole set of facts of consciousness. You know, here are the facts in consciousness. And one of those facts was that consciousness is fundamental. Matter of fact, it's the only thing that's fundamental. And mm -hmm. everything else is derived from consciousness. So consciousness is the superset and the physical world is a subset. And the way I knew that, the first way I knew that is that I could do things within consciousness that would affect the physical world such fundamentally. As, oh, such well, as. such as healing, such as, uh, you know, uh, modifying future probability using intent, you know, like the placebo effect, using intent to modify uh, what happens next. Right. So you can do that, but you can't do the opposite. You, you can't do things in a physical world that then modify, you know, consciousness in any fundamental way. So that means the arrow of causality goes from consciousness to the physical world. And logically, that means consciousness is the superset. The uh -huh. physical world is the subset, you see. That, so, and that's huge. I mean, it, yeah. it makes perfect sense. It's very logical. It's, it's simply understood. And yet the consequences of that, of that are huge. Absolutely. That's a big point. But that was just one of my consciousness facts. So I had all these consciousness facts, and then I had all these physical facts, because I'm a physicist, and that's what we do is gather right. physical facts. And I wanted to make a single, simple, elegant model that would explain all of those facts, uh -huh. that would explain the physics, because I knew the physical was the subset. So you should be able to derive physics from an understanding of consciousness. Those, two, you know, the causality flows that way. Sure. So that's what, that's what I did. And that's what I wrote my books to be. But by the time I published those books in 2003, I really hadn't phys figured out the physics part yet. I knew it was there because I knew consciousness was the superset, but I wasn't sure just how to express that. But about two years in, 2005 maybe, I got the aha on that. And suddenly, I was able to derive quantum physics. I was able to derive relativity, which are the two big things in science now. And I was able to solve all of the outstanding paradoxes in physics. Physics is just full of paradoxes. A paradox, a paradox for physics is something that experiment tells us that it's this way. Our experience tells us that it's this way, but we just don't understand it. It doesn't make any sense. Right. That's a paradox in physics. And... Quantum mechanics itself was a paradox. You know, why should particles be best represented as probability distributions, which uh -huh. they are? You know, yeah. why is this is the speed of light a constant? Nothing else is like that. Everything else that if the source of something is traveling and it ejects something, in other words, if you're in a car going 30 mile an hour and you mm -hmm. throw a ball 10 mile an hour in the forward direction of the car, then the ball will be going. 30 plus 10, mm -hmm. you know, how much you throw it plus how much the car was going relative to the ground. Right. Velocities always add. Well, you can have a source of light going any speed you like. And when the light comes out of that source, it goes the same speed. They're not additive. The speed of light is always a constant. It's never any less. It's never any more. It's mm -hmm. always a constant. And that is the fundamental piece of information that lets Einstein derive relativity. Relativity really comes out of that fact. You know, yeah. what, is the log what are the logical consequences of that fact? Well, those logical consequences of that fact is, is the science of relativity. Uh -huh. But that fact was always a mystery. Sort of like, why are particles really not particles, but probability distributions? Well, why is C a constant? So these are just two major paradoxes in physics, and I can derive both of them. And that means that the uh,
quantum physics is not weird science. It's logical science, just like any other science. Once you understand how it works and why it works that way, it couldn't be any different. Particles have to be probability distributions because there are no particles. You know, like the boy in the in the matrix, there is no spoon. You know, right. uh, that's basically the way it is. This reality is information based. Uh -huh. It's not material based. It's about information. Now that is logically equivalent to saying that this reality can be computed, which is logically equivalent to this information is a simulation, which is okay. the same as which is the same as this reality is a virtual reality. Right. But now, a lot of scientists, probably a very large minority, would agree with me. They'd all stand up and say, we agree with you, Tom. This reality is information based mm -hmm. because they've, long, they've gone long past the point where they think this is really a matter based reality. Now, phys physics thinks that an electron is not a chunk of mass with a charge. It's a point with the attributes of mass and charge. That's how mm -hmm. physics looks at an electron today. Okay. That's how, and, and, that, and, all, and that can be described completely by information. That's, that's, that's just information. That's the way you would simulate an electron. You make it a point, you give it the attributes of charge and mass. So they know that that's the case, but they don't know what to do after that. So many, many uh, scientists think that virtual reality is a good idea but they don't like to talk about it much because they can't explain it and they don't mm -hmm. understand it past that point. And uh -huh. we have people that go off on, on uh, oh, conjectures with virtual reality. Oh, it's uh, our future selves that are making this, this virtual reality for us and other such nonsense. Mm -hmm. And that's really not the way it works at all. I'm the only one, so my, my idea of virtual reality is very different than the rest that you'll see out in the world. And my idea is that consciousness is the computer. Mm. See, that makes the difference. Consciousness, consciousness is an information system. Consciousness, I define consciousness as awareness that makes choices. It's okay. an awareness that makes choices, okay? And that awareness, what is awareness? Awareness is something that's aware of what? It's aware of information. Sure. What, what are you aware of? What is your reality, your consciousness? Well, it's the data you take in through your five senses uh -huh. that defines your reality. It's information, right. Right. you see? So that consciousness is an information system, makes sense. It's about awareness. Awareness is about aware of information. Uh -huh. So if consciousness is an information system, then a part of that information system can be the computer that's computing this virtual reality. And uh -huh. the other part is the player. There's only two parts to a virtual reality, a computer right. and a player. You uh -huh. see, there really yeah. is no virtual reality. There's just the virtual reality exists in the minds of the players. And we are the players and we are a little chunk of that consciousness system. Uh -huh. See, we're, we're a piece of it. We're, uh, um, what can we say? Like you, uh, like if you have this big consciousness system, you can partition off just a little piece of that and give it a name and give it free will. And I call that an individuated unit of consciousness. And uh -huh. that's what you are and I am and everything else out there that's conscious. Not only people, but you know, dogs and cats and horses, and bumblebees sure. and everything that makes choices is, is right. conscious. So that's, see, that, that brings, that's another big thing, brings a lot of things together. We actually are all one. You see, we all uh -huh. are really just pieces of this larger consciousness system. Makes sense. And now here's the last part of it that uh, to kind of tie the logic together for you is that an information system evolves by lowering its entropy. And I will sure. explain that. Uh, an inf information system, well, let's say... Let, let's define entropy. Okay. For entropy, entropy is a measure of disorder. Mm -hmm. It's a measure of disorder. So high entropy is a lot of disorder. Chaos is high entropy. Mm -hmm. And lower entropy is less disorder, more order. So, so my garage is an example of entropy. In, in <laughs> right, that. right, yes. right. Okay. Your, your children's bedrooms, right, are an yes. example <laughs> of high, high entropy. Well, think of an information system as bits. Now, if all those bits are random, 
then that's very high entropy. That's the right. highest entropy thing. That's the highest entropy the system can, can have is all the bits are random, zero information. But what if you order some of those bits, put them in a special order? Well, now you have information, you see? So by ordering the bits, you create information. That, that little ordered bunch of bits could be a symbol for something, could mean uh -huh. something to you. You see, it could right. be a number, could be a letter in an alphabet, it could be all sorts of things. It's, uh -huh. uh, so you order it. So an information system creates information by order, mm -hmm. by lowering its entropy. You see, that's, uh -huh. that's how an information system evolves. Its evolutionary pressure is to lower its entropy. Now, it gets to a point where its entropy reduction, its evolution slows down because it's just one big monolithic thing. You know, it's just this consciousness system. Uh -huh. And it's kind of limited because just being a single monolithic thing is a very limiting thing. You can't think outside of your own head because you're the only head there is. So what it decided for its evolution and cells figured out the same thing is it split off part of itself, gave that piece free will. It created an individuated unit of consciousness, gave it free will. Now there's two free wills interacting with each other and that produces lots more possibilities. Uh -huh. Now you can have a conversation. Now you can have a discussion. Now you can have an argument, you see, where you couldn't before. So then right. you make lots of those individuated units of consciousness, you know, thousands of them, hundreds of thousands of them. Uh -huh. And what you end up with is a social system. Now, consciousness evolves toward lower entropy. Consciousness now uh -huh. is a social system. The way you lower entropy in a social system is through cooperation, uh -huh. caring, you know, working together, being about other, not about self. The way right. you in, the way you inhibit and a, make a, a social system dysfunction functional is by not caring, being self-centered, being fearful, no trust. You see that then inhibits yeah. a social system. Uh -huh. So I call that the love side, which is the caring, the compassion, the empathy. And uh -huh. the fear side, which basically is the no trust, uh, control, power, force side, that's, uh -huh. that's, that's where fear takes you. Right. And so those are the two sides. So that gets us to the next big, big aha thing. And that is the system of which we are a part. The larger consciousness system is evolving. And how is it evolving? It's evolving by becoming love by caring, by getting rid of fear, by getting rid of ego, by getting mm -hmm. rid of belief. That's how it evolves. And what about us? We're pieces of that system. Well, right. how come we have this virtual reality? Because as pieces of that system, our job to help the system evolve and help ourselves evolve as pieces of consciousness was to lower our entropy, become right. more caring, become more love. You see, that's our job. But we're all in this big chat room. We're just talking to each other. There's no, you know, that's what consciousness does, right? It shares information. Right. It shares data. But yes. there's, there's very few consequences in a big chat room. Very, very few consequences. So it's real hard to learn because you can just chat away, but still not learn very much. So the system needed a, another reality frame, another rule set in which it would create an environment for us where we had lots of consequences with our choices, things mm -hmm. that would help us evolve, give us choices, you know, that were serious, important choices to us, right. ethical choices, moral choices that you right. don't have really in a big chat room or you don't have it very much. So sure. the system, so the system designed a virtual reality. And how did it do that? it took some initial conditions and a rule set. That rule set is what we call physics, chemistry, biology. It's the rules. What science does. Mathematics too, don't Yeah, mathematics. Yeah, what, what, what the science does is it digs out the rules. Yes, absolutely, mathematics. Yeah. So it has this rule set and it punches the run button and this, this simulation begins to evolve and it has to evolve Okay, what was the initial conditions? Well, it was this ball of plasma 
small but very high pressure, very high temperature. And when the run buttons hit, it can expand and change according to the rule set. Well, that reminds you of Big Bang, doesn't it? Except it's the yeah. digital Big Bang. It's a simulation. Right. You see? Now, already we've solved a lot of problems. Physics has a big problem with, with saying, how did the Big Bang occur? Because we, as a, as, a, um, as a reality, didn't exist yet. So where did that ball of plasma come from? Uh -huh. Yeah, where was that? Because that predates us. Uh -huh. And see, that's another one of these uh, paradoxes in physics. Well, they start with a big bang, but they can't explain it. It seems to have, have to pop out of nothing. Right. Well, the simulation explains it. It's just the initial conditions that go along with the rule set that eventually evolves to become this virtual reality. Uh -huh. Another thing it explains is there's this thing called the... Um, Anthropomorphic principle, I think, which is physicists have come up with or have, have told us that there are a set of constants that describe the universe. And if you changed any one of those constants, even in an eighth decimal place, the whole universe would collapse. It wouldn't work. Uh -huh. you know, it wouldn't be stable. Okay, so, right. And they called it anthropomorphic because it seemed like these constants were picked just for us, you know, just so we could evolve here. And right. that's, of course, doesn't go well with science, but that's that's the way yeah, it the, the randomness well, of science, yeah. And, yeah. and in fact, when I worked as a statistician, I had to rely on a, a fundamental assumption behind probability and statistics that I didn't like inherently believe, and that is in randomness, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so here we have a good answer for that. You know, why is it like that? Well, think of this, this uh, simulation. We'll call it the big digital bang. And it's got a rule set. It's got initial conditions. And it's big digital bang. Take one. They push the run button. Oh, it blows up. It doesn't work. It isn't stable. Okay, change those numbers a little bit. A little less gravity. A little more of this, you know. Uh -huh. Okay, take two. We run it again. Well, got a little bit further, but still had a problem. Well, change that. Right. So you do that often enough. In other words, you're evolving the simulation with trial and error, like evolution is. And uh -huh. eventually, you tune it so that these numbers are just so precisely tuned that this thing holds together for a long enough time to do what you want it to do, which is evolve avatars that are interesting for consciousness to play. Right. You see, now here's the deal. And, with and we've climbed in, we, we are the avatars, We're the right? avatar. Yeah, no, we're, yeah, our bodies are the avatars, and we, who we really are, are the individuated units of consciousness that are playing those avatars. Right. See, virtual reality is defined this way. It takes, one, a computer, mm -hmm. and it takes, two, a player. Okay, now the computer has to have the rule set and be able to compute things, so it takes that. But, uh, so that's, there's only two things there. It's a player and a computer. The computer computes the game, right. renders the game, and the player makes the choices for the avatar in the game. Sure. Right. Because the avatar is just a pretty picture. It's just something to let the player get a sense of what's going on and the interactions and that sort of thing. The virtual reality doesn't actually exist. So the consciousness system is the computer, uh -huh. and the IUOCs, individual units of consciousness, are the players the virtual reality was created because with this tight rule set that defines just every energy exchange creates the context in which there's lots and lots of choices that are very significant. So now we individuated units of consciousness log on to make the choices for a player in this virtual reality. And by those choices, we evolve or de-evolve. If our choices are toward love and caring and compassion, then we evolve our consciousness. And as we evolve, the whole system evolves, mm -hmm. you see? So, yeah. so that, ties it, that ties it all together in a, you know, I've just skimming over the top of a lot of ideas. I know I sound like a, a raving lunatic to probably a no, lot of your listeners. No, but, and, and you make perfect sense to yeah. me. And it, um, I think that for many of our listeners, although some of these concepts are, can be a little hard to grasp, I think they they may resonate, and, mm -hmm. and sometimes we have this deep knowingness. So it's in, in a sense on a physical level, I think of it as re, a reduction in the entropy because it it goes from feeling a little less chaotic to greater ease. 
Um, so that's mm -hmm. my way of interpreting mm -hmm. truth. Um, mm -hmm. But I've got a question for you. I've, I've had some okay. fascinating experiences and I know you, oh gosh, you write about some of your fascinating experiences. Okay, so if we're in a virtual reality, one of the things I've experienced, I've interacted with another version of myself mm -hmm. where my father had made a different choice and never moved from Nebraska. So I'm still living in Nebraska um, and you know, had a different life, had a different husband, had a different, you know, like the whole, mm -hmm. the whole path. Mm -hmm. um, so how does that fit into this concept of this virtual reality? It fits into it perfectly. Okay, here's, I'll give a little description on that. In order for the rendering engine that renders this reality to be ready to render it, it has to render it as we do things, right? So it has to, it has to do this in real time. It needs a, to create this database that's called the future probable reality. Now that's, that's all the things that could possibly happen and the probability that they might. That way it kind of knows what the, what the probabilities are of what's going to happen next. So it can get ready and do, you know, it's, so it's a tool for the, for the uh, rendering engine to know uh -huh. what to do, stay in real time. Well, that database, as time goes by, becomes, you know, the, the future becomes the past after a while. A particular right. future becomes the past. So now you have this past database is everything that could have happened and the probability that it would have. Uh -huh. And the actual past that we know of, we call our history, is just a, a thread that threads its way through that probable past, you know, all that data uh -huh. in the past database. Now that database is available for us because we're individuated units of consciousness. This is all done in consciousness. That database is available for us. Now, right. everything in there that we have done, everything in there that, that we have said, thought, felt, thought about doing, but didn't do, you know, everything is in that database. And it's there with all of the possibilities and the probability for those possibilities. Uh -huh. So if you, you know, when, when you remote view, you're just getting data from that database. When uh -huh. you're looking at somebody's health aura to see, you know, what's what their problems are, you're getting data from that database. Right. When you, uh, f you know, when you uh, connect with a person and you kind of immediately know where their emotions are, where their feelings are, where they're coming from, where this problem came from, you're getting all that data out of the database. Okay. Well, you get into a database and if you're not real careful about defining what you're looking for in a database, you sometimes get off the track a little. And if you don't uh -huh. say, I'm interested only in that data that is part of our history line, well, you end up in the database looking at things that were just probable, but uh -huh. were never actually actualized here. Well, so you got into the past database in a probable past where uh -huh. things were different and yes. your father made other choices. Uh -huh. And you can look through that database because all the probabilities are there. And if he made this choice, then it's probable he would have made another and another and another. And it just all the probabilities are there for a pretty long piece of time. And as you get interested in that, oh, that's interesting. Uh -huh. I wonder where that leads. Well, then right. you just start exploring. See, it's your intent that gets around in that database. So your intent starts exploring all of that database which is the in the past but it's the everything that could have happened and the probability it would have mm -hmm. so what happens is the system works this out like in the future probabilities it says okay here it is for like the next delta t simulations are done you know a little time increment at a time they're okay. updated that's what makes it that's what gives it dynamics things that move okay because we calculate okay it's moved a little so next i'll move the picture a little over next time you see right so Every delta T, it looks at it and says, all right, what's the probable future look like here? And what if I put that out another delta T? What, what would likely be? And I can go, I can do that as far out in the future as I want. Uh -huh. Of course, as you get farther out, the answers are a lot rattier because you as a statistician know that you're, you're compounding your errors as you go out. Right, right. because so, the, the probability, and, and I think of it as, if you think in terms of a timeline, there are all these points of, of probable you know probabilities where you can go in various directions right but the farther out you get the more trees you know branches there right. have become. 
So it gets to be more and more complex and the, the probability of being able to accurately say what happens goes down and down, down and down. Right. And so the, exactly. Branches. So the further you get out and when you get into the, into the first section of book two, I'll have pictures of this, it's like just what you said. And uh, anyway, so it does this and it goes out as far as it seems is reasonable to go. And some things are easier to uh, predict, like, you know, how, you know, uh, you know, how high mountains are, and they wear down with erosion, you know, you can kind right. of predict that some things are very difficult, if they have to do with people and people making choices with their free will, but it, it predicts those out as far as is reasonable. And as far as actually you ask it to, it will do that. So that's available. So when that goes into history, then you have history in depth. You have these delta T's that have been worked out for, let's say, a year in advance, or two years, or ten years, or decades, uh -huh. and and you can explore all of that probability. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the information that's available to you as a consciousness. So you can you can you can query the database and do remote viewing. Now I'm querying it about what's happening over at the spot that I'm not in. Or I can query the database and say, I'd like to see uh, Christine's uh, health aura. Well, now you get health aura on Christine, or I'd like to see Christine's uh, emotional state or right. Christine's uh, um, spiritual development, you know, right. and right. you get data. And the neat thing about this database is that you can you can specify the output format. You get really? to specify it. Yeah. So you what can you make a, you can make up the out. Uh, let's say that you uh, want to look at health, and you want to look at health versus time. Well, you have uh, health. Let's say on the, the y axis. You have time on the x axis, and you can say, show me a curve starting from now. I want every. Uh, you know, if it's a long term, I want every uh, five years, you know, for the next for the next 50 years. And I want to see a curve with health on this axis where up here is is healthy, very healthy. The uh -huh. bottom is zero. That's dead. Uh -huh. no, zero health. And you can look the curve and you can see where it'll go over the next 50 years. And that's that's getting data out of the probability database. And if you're a statistician <clears throat> like you are, you can say, well, I'd like to see the. Uh, the uh, standard deviation or three standard deviations, you know, right. uh, of, uh, of error on that. And it'll get you that you'll see the curve and then you'll see the error bars. So and then you can, that you can basically see, um, you know, how deterministic it is. It is right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And yeah. you can do all kinds of statistics. Yeah, I've had a couple of people in my class that were statisticians. And oh, they just loved it. Once they learned that, you know, they were getting like, you know, graphs in five different colors with, uh, you know, all kinds of, you know, all kinds of statistical uh, uh, um, reports back, you know, they were looking at situations and, and, and they were getting, uh, you know, chi square and, and t tests and all sorts of things they, they were they were getting back these results and curves and they just yeah. went crazy they they thought yeah. that was wonderful but let's say let's say if you want to look at somebody's emotional body well you can if you don't specify any kind of a, a output format you'll get a default format okay red bright red zigzaggy lines like this are going to be kind of anger and upset but that's just default. If you want to say, well, look, I'd like mine to be like this. I'd like, you know, little pink lines that go in little swirls to be anger instead of red zigzaggy lines. And I'd like the red to be, um, I don't know what, happiness. Well, then you'll get, uh -huh. it'll come out however it is you specify. This you is see? amazing. You so get to specify the output format and the database query system queries with your intent. Okay, but you have to be, it's not your intellect, you have to be in an intuitive state. This right. is all happens in intuitive space. So you have to get out of your intellect into the intuitive space, uh -huh. you have to cut the noise in your mind, you know, if your noise is full of thoughts and stuff that gets in the way. Right. And, and you have to be able to focus your mind on a particular thing and hold that focus clearly. So all the things that you do now, when you get data, you know, when you get information, all the, the kind of the paranormal things that you that you do in a day, and by now, I'm sure you do most of it without even thinking about it, it just happens. 
you know, as people come, as people go, you know, the information comes and goes with them. And uh -huh. it's not really something you have to do on purpose. But you can, uh, you know, you, you get all that information, you can output it in graphs, you can do statistics with it, because mm -hmm. the system is very mathematical. The system loves math too. consciousness, you know, the simulations, it's all built on mathematics. So when you tell it to do some complex, you know, statistical test or something, oh, it has no problems with that. It, it loves it. It says, great. I finally got somebody that's asking me an interesting question. And, right. uh, and you'll get all that, that stuff back. So that's. Okay. So that's before we go works. any further, I, I know eventually we're going to run out of time. You just mentioned about your classes. I know that it's, it's not just you evaluating what happens. You teach people how to get into these states. You teach people yeah. how to access this database um, so that we can not only have the awareness but create more, more um, conscious choices and, and create less entropy in our own lives, which of course right. will have a ripple effect. How can people connect with you? Well, uh, there's, the, there's really a lot of ways. Uh, they can go to my website, which is, which is uh, mybigtoe.com, www.mybigtoe.com. Um, they can go to MBT events, which is the things I'm doing. Uh, oh. These days, it's almost all virtual because we don't, right. uh, you know, we don't group up anymore. But uh, you, you can see events there. Uh, I have a huge YouTube um, yeah. set. You know, yeah. there's there's literally lots more than a thousand hours of video there. Yeah. So it's kind of and I subscribe. I highly recommend um, yeah. subscribing to your YouTube channel. Yeah. That, yeah. Well, there's, there's so much there, but I can point out just a couple of things that your users might or your listeners might uh, like to hear. Uh, one, if they're interested in paranormal things, and I should say that, you know, there's nothing really that special about being able to do paranormal things. But mm -hmm. in, as you learn to do paranormal things, you also learn to grow up. In the mm -hmm. process of doing paranormal things, you find out that there's something larger than you. <laughs> You're yeah, just a yeah. small piece of something bigger. Well, that, that helps uh, get rid of some of your arrogance. And yeah. you, you have to quiet your mind. You have to be able to focus. You have to get rid of your ego or your ego is going to trash the information you get back. You're going to color sure. it and interpret it and put errors into it. You mm -hmm. have to get rid of your beliefs or your beliefs are going to color your information. So. Right. And when you work in that field, unintentionally, maybe, you find out that you're just growing up, you're getting rid of your ego, mm -hmm. you're getting rid of your beliefs, you're, you're much more lower entropy consciousness, you're evolving the quality of your consciousness. So right. paranormal things are neither here nor there. But the process of learning those things demands that you grow up. And people who are really People who are really good at these things also tend to be kinder, nicer, more uh -huh. caring, more uh, open people, because uh -huh. that's where you have to go in order to really master these things. So they're good learning tools, you know, like like the little like the little uh, wheels that people put on children's bikes, you know. To it, it's right. it's something that helps you learn. Wheel. Yeah, like the training wheels helps you learn. So anyway, you can go to my site and you can look up a, a, a course I gave at TMI because I videotaped all of it. And it tells you how to communicate telepathically. It tells you how to remote view. It tells you how to heal. It tells you how to get data out of databases. Mm -hmm. And it tells you, you know, how to approach it, things to do, things not to do, what the problems are, because... What, what it is, is I give a little talk about how to do it. People go and do it. It's an experiential course. Okay. And I, they, they have binaural beats that they listen to that help. If they're not good meditators, then that helps them stay in a productive meditation state. If they are good, as far as meditation goes, they, they've already learned that skill. Then I say, leave the binaural beats alone. You won't need them. But if uh -huh. you do need them, you can use them. And those binaural beats you can get from MBT events. I think there's like 13 or 14 binaural beats. They cost like $20 or something like that. Uh -huh. So it's not much. So you can look at that course. That course costs $2,500 to be in it, but it's free. 
All you have to do is spend twenty dollars for the binaural beats, and you can take the whole course That's and listen fabulous. to every bit of it. And then the only thing you don't get is able to ask your own questions. But all the people who are there in the class are going to ask your questions because right, right. these people come from all you know. They're, some of them are beginners, some of them are old hands, some of them you know are healers, some of them are all sorts of things. And you're going to get all of these questions because we spend hours and hours with questions. So That's probably 90% of the questions you would ask, somebody else is gonna ask anyway. Uh -huh. So yeah. you can take this $2,500 course for free just by getting that one YouTube site. And the other, the other um, YouTube uh, video that I'd send them to, if you're really interested in the science part, I gave a lecture in Los Angeles and the YouTube name is MBT slash LA space 2016 i mm -hmm. gave this lecture in 2016 and mm -hmm. it was basically about the science in mbt so if you're a science person and you'd like to kind of see you know what's the logic here or at least some of it as much as you can give you know in a in a, in a day's lecture but I, i've warned people these are long you know i i talk all day long and uh -huh. you know it's a course so it's, it's all day long and they come out in like probably one and a half hour segments so that's a lot yeah. There's a lot of video there to watch. But, and, and, but one of the things that, that you are really good at, um, Tom, is to explain things in layperson's terms. Um, There's some fabulous physicists out there who don't do as good a job at that. <laughs> so you, you make it accessible, um, which I think is wonderful for those of us who are, you know, a bit towards the scientific nerdiness, you know, and, and want to learn it. Um, because it's, it's accessible. You don't have to be a physicist to understand. No, you don't. But you know, one of the, one of the um, motivations I had for writing my book was to provide an on-ramp for the left brain logical process people, because to, an on-ramp to the big picture. Right. Because right. Th there's this big picture out there that people need to see, people need to be aware of. But people who do logical process have a hard time going down that path. You know, they sure. they just can't get there. They throw the book down and say, ah, where's the proof? Where's yeah. the logic? I don't get this. It's just a belief baloney and they throw it away. So my book is written primarily to be an on-ramp for those people who need logical process because it'll yeah. take them with logical process all the way through and show them the big picture. Right. So, and that and it, again, it's my big toe and T-O-E is theory of everything. Yeah. Um, so um, we're, we're running out of time here, but- um, <laughs> One hour it, just isn't enough, is oh, it? Oh, <laughs> it's not, it's not. Um, I know that you talked about fear relates to entropy. Mm -hmm. Do you have a brief message, like a minute or, or less to listeners right now, because we are in this, you know, this supposed pandemic with these horrible consequences, supposedly, and it's um, people are in a, the state of chaos and fear and anxiety. Okay. Yes, a little, a little message, uh, less than a minute or so. Um, focus on the positive. Mm -hmm. Don't focus on the negative. When you focus on the negative, that brings up thing, more things that are negative, which bring up more things that are negative. And pretty soon, you, pretty soon you've worked yourself into you know, an anxiety attack and right. you, you are crippling yourself. Yeah. Try to let go of that. Focus on the positive. Look at the things that are good, the things you do have, the things that, you know, that are good in your life. Look at the relationships you have that are good in your life. Uh -huh. Be... be be happy, have gratitude that you have a warm place in the winter to stay, that you have food to eat, that you're not cold, wet, hungry, and miserable. You know, a lot of people are. So look at that and feel gratitude for that. Look at the positive. And if all you get on the newsfeed and off the internet is negativity and fear and oh no, oh no, the sky's falling and you get all sorts of things, just turn it off. Stop looking at it. Good. Forget yes. the forget the news. Turn the TV off. You know, just yeah. don't go there. Stay positive. Just focus on the stuff that's good. Enjoy what's good, and smile. Be happy. Yeah. Take time to say something nice to somebody. Take time to.
tell somebody you love them and that you care about them and that you're glad to be sharing your life with them. Yeah. Uh, you know, develop a great, great final message from yeah. the, the scientist and very conscious <laughs> uh, individual. And uh, oh my gosh, I'm so grateful you joined us here today, Tom. And I'm really grateful that you've been doing this work because um, this, this can help shift our planet. I really believe this. That it's, it's such an, an important step of our planetary evolution. And thank you for mm -hmm. that. Oh, you're quite welcome. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> uh, yeah. And thank you all for joining us here today. I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks so much for tuning in today. If you'd like to empower yourself to step further into your vibration of change, please visit my website at christineupchurch.com where you can learn more about my insights, upcoming events, and private sessions.